Hello and welcome to today's lecture on multithreading and multiprocessing. Here we shall discuss about uh, thread level parallelism and we shall also see how uh, multiple processors can be used uh, for multithreading, multi -thread, multiple thread processing and multiprocessing. Uh, we have seen that initial computer performance improvements came from the use of innovative manufacturing techniques and advancement of VLSI technology. The computers, if you go to the early history of computers, you will see many innovative technology were incorporated to improve the performance. Then of course, when the VLSI technology uh, was available, uh, the advancement of VLSI technology has reduced the size of the devices and increased the speed of processing. So, as a cons consequence, computer performance uh, improvement took place based on these two uh, techniques, innovative manufacturing techniques and advancement of VLSI technology. Subsequently, in later, later years, most improvements came from exploitation of instruction level parallelism and we have discussed instruction level parallelism in details and we have seen how hardware and software can be used uh, to achieve instruction level parallelism. We have discussed about pipelining, uh, dynamic instruction scheduling, out of order execution, we have discussed about VLIW and uh, vector processing I shall discuss little bit later on. And these are essentially utilizes the instruction level parallelism available and uh, we have seen how different processors have been implemented using this instruction level parallelism. Particularly in the last three lectures we have discussed Intel series of processors and how the, uh, how the instruction level parallelism have been incorporated starting with pipelining in different processors and leading to performance improvement. But uh, it has now been uh, recognized that instruction level parallelism is now fully exploited. That means, whatever parallelism is possible, whatever performance gain is possible by exploiting instruction level parallelism is already done. And uh, modern multiple issue processors have become incredibly complex, we have seen that those uh, superscalar processors uh, where uh, the multiple issues of uh, I mean issue of multiple instructions are done, uh, they require uh, very uh, large silicon real estate and the they are very complex and processor performance improvement through increasing complexity, increasing silicon and increasing power seem to be diminishing. That means, we have reached more or less a point of diminishing return. That means, uh, even after providing lot of hardware or using more sophisticated software, the performance gain that is achieved uh, now uh, utilizing or exploiting instruction level parallelism is uh, minimal, very small. So, what to do? What is the way out? Way out is we have to look for something else. So, do the way to achieve higher performance of late by exploitation of thread and process level parallelism is being focused. So, uh, uh, that means, uh, exploit parallelism existing across multiple processes and threads. So, uh, now we are uh, doing it at looking at parallelism at little higher level, not at the instruction level, but at uh, process level and thread level. And uh, it has been found that this type of parallelism whatever is achieved by this cannot be done by instruction level parallelism. So, uh, for example, if you consider uh, a banking applications, nowadays uh, you know centralized banking has become very popular. So, uh, there are many users which are, uh, which are communicating to a bank through internet. So, and uh, each user is, a, is a accessing the uh, banks and doing transactions. So, multiple transactions are taking place concurrently and it is done by different users. So, individual transactions 
uh, which are taking place can be executed in parallel. So, if we if, if we consider nowadays core bank uh, core banking or uh, centralized banking system, where all the transactions uh, which are done initiated by uh, multiple users can be executed in parallel. That means, here the parallelism is uh, more or less inherent or built in in the application itself. Now, let us consider uh, the difference between process and thread. As we know, a process is a program in execution. Uh, 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 you are running different uh, programs for different applications uh, like word processing and various other applications. And each application, whenever a program is in run, program is running, we call it uh, a process. And as we know, an application normally consists of multiple processes. So, uh, 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 normally a single application is broken down into multiple processes, and then multiple processes can run concurrently, even for a single application. On the other hand, a, th a process consists of one or more uh, threads. So, here we can say uh, we, we can say a pro an application application program can uh, can lead to multiple multiple processes. A single application will give you multiple processes and each process, each process and in turn can give you multiple threads. So, this is the relationship between process and thread. That means, a process can be an application can be broken down in multiple processes and a process can be broken down into multiple threads. So, now, in what way do they differ? A, a process and a thread differs. Threads belonging to the same process share data and code space. So, let us have a look at the difference between a process and a thread. So, let us consider look at uh, uh, let, uh, let us consider a single threaded a single threaded process in which case you will find that it will share it, it will require a particular process will require code data and files so you will require code data and files and then you will require to execute a particular program you will require registers to store the intermediate results while processing a program you will require stack, uh, stack whenever you uh, do subroutine call, you have to store the uh, you know that uh, the various parameters on the stack and also when you do context switching, you will require stack. So, you will require registers and stack and then you will be running a single thread like this. So, a thread is this is a single thread for a single process running. So, this is a single threaded process. Now, let us consider uh, uh, a multi threaded process. Multi threaded process. In a multi threaded process, the, the code data and files these will be shared by multiple threads. However, you will require suppose you are creating three threads. So, you will require separate registers, separate registers, separate stack so you will require registers stack registers 
stack and then you have one thread here, this is another thread, this is another thread. This part is shared by all the threads. So, you can see here uh, in a multi threaded process, uh, you are sharing the same code space data and files. However, you will require separate uh, set of registers, separate stack for different threads. So, these are different threads. So, this is a multi threaded process. I believe in your uh, operating system course, you will learn about process thread in more details. Question naturally arises, how do you create threads? How a thread can be created? Fortunately, uh, by using uh, a different, uh, I mean there are popular thread libraries provided like POSIX P threads, Win32 threads, Java threads. So, they will facilitate you in implementing, in creating threads. So, with the help of these thread libraries, you can create threads. Now, the threads can be of two types. One is your user thread, another is kernel thread what is the difference between user thread and kernel thread. So, first let us focus on user thread. In case of user thread, the thread management is done in user space. We have already discussed about virtual memory management, there we have seen the, the kernel space, user space, we have uh, mentioned about that. And here, uh, whenever uh, user threads are created, the thread management is done in user space and user threads are supported and managed without kernel support. And obviously, uh, since it is done without kernel support, this is uh, these user threads are invisible to the kernel and if a thread gets blocked, the entire process gets blocked. So, uh, and as a consequence, because of this uh, limitation, whenever one uh, thread gets blocked, entire process gets, gets blocked it has got limited benefits, it provides you limited benefit of uh, threading. On the other hand, whenever you go for kernel threads, kernel threads are supported and managed directly by the operating system. So, operating system uh, takes full, full, full control of kernel threads and uh, kernel creates lightweight processes. So, uh, sometimes we call uh, threads as lightweight processes. <coughs> and modern operating systems support kernel threads, for example, Windows XP 2000, Solaris, Linux, Mac uh, operating system, etcetera. All these modern operating systems support these kernel threads. Now, let us have a look at so, we have now understood the, uh, def, uh, we have de defined what is thread, we have discussed about the relationship between process and thread. Now, let us have a look at the benefits of threading, what kind of benefit do we get whenever we do, we do the uh, threading. First of all, uh, uh, responsiveness. We have seen that threads share code and data. We have seen in this particular diagram that these code data, this part is shared whenever we create, uh, create threads. So, uh, uh, thread creation and switching therefore, uh, is much more efficient than that of processes. So, whenever we switch from one process to another process, suppose let us consider uh, a single processing system. So, in a single processing system also you can have uh, multiple process or multiple threads. So, whenever we switch from one process to another process, it will involve a uh, lot of overhead. I mean, uh, the, the you have to, you have to uh, store and restore uh, various information, uh, particularly since code data and files are separate. But since you are sharing the code data and files uh, for a for different threads, the thread creation and switching is much more efficient. 
So, as an example, uh, if you uh, look at the uh, threads created by supported by Solaris operating system, it has been found that creating threads is 30 times less costly than processes and context switching is about 5 times faster than processes. That means, creation of thread is uh, much more efficient, switching of thread I mean one thread to another thread is also much more efficient. So, uh, this this uh, this tells you the benefit this gives you the benefit of uh, thread uh, multi threading compared to uh, multi processing. And uh, it gives you truly concurrent execution and of course, this concurrent execution is possible uh, provided you have got enough support of, of the hardware. That means, uh, if we want to do uh, multiple threads to run concurrently, there should be some support from the hardware. Without the support from the hardware, you cannot really do that. In what kind of supports are available in uh, in uh, in present day processors? So, present day processor supports are available in the form of uh, SMP, symmetric multiprocessing systems. I shall go into the details of it later on. Symmetric multiprocessing system, multiprocessing. We have got multiple processors. multiple multi multi processors symmetric multi processor then you can have multi core in case of symmetric multi processors uh, the processors may be on different cores or different chips but in a multi core you have got uh, uh, multiple cores multiple processors on a single die or we shall see that symmetric multi threading I shall discuss in detail about in more details which is also known as hyper threading. So, uh, with the help of this you can have concurrent uh, execution of multiple threads. Now, uh, uh, let us consider a case for processor support for thread level parallelism. Using pure uh, instruction level parallelism, execution unit utilization is only about 20 to 25 percent. So, we have seen that uh, whenever you are having uh, multiple processing elements multiple processing elements as we have seen uh, these are present in all modern processors uh, we have seen the pentium series of processors where there are uh, 7 to 9 uh, different types of execution units available so these execution units how much they are utilized utilization of uh, these executed units are to be considered. Okay, in the hardware, you have provided multiple e execution units. Can they be fruitfully or uh, meaningfully utilized or they will remain idle in most of the situations? So, it has been found that uh, using pure instruction level parallelism, execution unit utilization is only about 20 to 25 percent in modern processors, where you have got uh, a large uh, say 8, 9 uh, execution units, processing units. So, utilization is limited by control dependency, cache misses during memory access and so on. So, we have discussed about different types of hazards. So, whenever you do pipelining, you will, you will be encountering uh, different types of hazards. Then you have different types of dependencies, data dependency, control dependency, structural dependency and so on. So, here by creating multiple execution units, you can overcome the structural dependency that structural hazards will not be there, but the control dependency uh, that will occur because of uh, you know whenever you are uh, executing in a loops or decisions, then um, the control hazards will be 
generated. So, because of this utilization of the instruction level parallelism is very limited. So, it is rare for units to be even reasonably busy on the average. <coughs> and in pure instruction level parallelism at any time only one thread is under execution. So, this is a limitation whenever we go for pure instruction level parallelism only one thread is under execution at any point of nine. So, this demonstrates or this uh, particularly uh, tells you that it is very much essential to go for uh, multi threading <coughs> or utilize thread level parallelism. Now, utilization of the execution units can be improved, how you can have several threads under execution and uh, for example, in Pentium 3 these are called active threads. So, whenever you have multiple threads under execution you can uh, I mean you can we may give different names, but, uh, um, but it is uh, you can uh, concurrent uh, execution of threads are taking place whatever may be the names. So, these are known as active threads in Pentium 3 and it executes several threads at at the same time for, uh, by using as I have told SMP, uh, SMT and multi core processors. So, uh, uh, this clearly tells you the need for thread level parallelism. Now, uh, threads in applications where they are widely used, threads are natural to a wide ranging set of application whenever one more or less independent often more or less independent. I mean, so in many applications we will find the different applications are independent, they do not depend on one another. So, completely independent applications can run and they can be naturally multi threaded. And uh, there may be some data sharing, though data sharing uh, uh, can take place among them to some extent, but that will not, uh, uh, I mean that can be uh, provided without much of difficulty. So, limited amount of data with limited amount of data sharing these multiple applications uh, can run independently and also sometimes there may be a need for synchronization. Sometimes uh, also synchronization among themselves will be needed and for synchronization there are uh, techniques available uh, and uh, with the help of that synchronization, synchronization process synchronization and thread level synchronization can be achieved. So, here are few thread examples given. So, independent threads occur naturally in several applications as I was telling and these are some of the applications where uh, uh, these thread level uh, parallelism uh, can be will occur uh, and uh, you can utilize them. Number one is web server. So, different HTTP requests are threads. So, uh, a web server is giving service to a large number of people and, and uh, different each uh, HTTP request can be considered as separate threads. Similarly, a file server is giving service to a large number of users and their uh, uh, data is being stored, uh, files are being stored in the server and uh, from the server uh, it is uh, I mean it is accessed by multiple users uh, locally or remotely whatever it may be. Uh, then each of them can be considered as separate threads. Similarly, in your uh, whenever you go for uh, re re implementing internet service you will require name server. So, name servers uh, also uh, are receiving multiple requests from different sources and in such cases also each of these requests can be served by using multiple threads. So, similarly as I have already told in banking applications it is possible to have independent transactions, these independent transactions can be uh, independently uh, threaded and uh, can be taken care of by independent threads. Sim and not only in servers, in desktop applications also uh, it is possible to have uh, independent threads because uh, in uh, even in desktop applications different types of uh, functions are being performed like file loading, display of uh, data on the screen, uh, computation etcetera 
can be different threads. So, uh, even in a, uh, a simple desktop, uh, you can have uh, multiple threads. So, this, uh, this gives you uh, examples of different threads. Now, so we can uh, say we are now convinced that threading is inherent to any server application and threads are also easily identifiable uh, in traditional applications like banking, scientific computations, etcetera. <coughs> now, uh, we have discussed about instruction level parallelism and we have uh, briefly discussed about multi-threading. Now, can one support each other? So, here uh, we can have uh, instruction, level, instruction level parallelism support to exploit thread level parallelism can be done and you can configure processors accordingly. For example, you can have uh, uh, four possible configurations. You can have a superscalar processor with no multi threading support. This is one possibility. So, here uh, uh, you will be using only instruction level parallelism, but no thread level parallelism. Second possibility is a superscalar process, uh, uh, processor with coarse grained uh, multi threading. So, multi threading can be of two types fine grained and coarse grained, we shall discuss about that. And uh, with coarse grained uh, multi threading, third is a superscalar with fine grained multi threading. So, that can be supported or a superscalar processor with simultaneous multi threading. So, this uh, fine grained multi threading, coarse grained multi threading and simultaneous multi threading, these techniques, these we shall discuss later on and uh, in a modern superscalar processor, this can be supported uh, uh, very easily. Now, uh, we have so far we have uh, discussed about the benefits of multi threading. We have seen uh, various advantages and uh, different applications which inherently support multi threading and you can gain uh, you can uh, utilize the execution units uh, more uh, efficiently uh, using multi threading. So, the advantages we have discussed, but in this world nothing is one sided obviously, there will be some disadvantages and here some of them are uh, highlighted. So, threads have to be identified by the programmer and unfortunately, no rules exist as to what can be meaningful thread. So, uh, a, a programmer has to use his experience intuition to create threads, there is no generalized uh, rule. Say, okay, follow this algorithm and create threads. So, that type of thing unfortunately, does not exist. So, uh, no rules exist as to what can be a meaningful thread and thread can, threads can possi cannot possibly be identified by any automatic static or dynamic analysis of code. So, uh, you cannot uh, you, by analyzing autom automatic static or dynamic analysis also code does not really uh, lead to identification of threads, how you can create meaningful threads. So, what is happening uh, in nutshell, it is uh, putting a burden on the programmer. So, uh, it, uh, that multi threading uh, it can be considered uh, some kind of burden, uh, burden on the programmer, it requires careful thinking and programming. As I have already told experience, intuition, this plays important role. Uh, in, in this type of situation. And moreover, uh, threads with severe dependencies. So, a, an, applica an application program may have severe dependencies. So, whenever there are severe dependencies, uh, that may make multi threading an exercise in futility. In other words, so whenever you have got severe dependencies, uh, you may not really achieve. Uh, uh, I mean fruitful multiple threads, useful multiple threads. So, uh, as a consequence, the, the thread level parallelism is not as programmers friendly as ILP. So, in case of instruction level parallelism, we have seen that programmer or user 
is not is not really much uh, not much bothered it is taken care of by hardware in most of the situations and since it is taken care of uh, uh, by the programmer uh, by the uh, hardware in most of the situations it is very programmer friendly programmers are very happy with that but that is not the situation in thread level parallelism so i have already uh, discussed about it uh, threads are lightweight fine grained uh, threads are share address space data and files even when uh, extent of data sharing and synchronization is low exploitation of thread level parallelism is meaningful only when communication latency is low so this is another very important uh, important parameter communication so different processes and threads have to communicate with each other. So, that communication overhead you have to consider, you have to take into consideration. So, uh, it all depends on how different processors are connected, are they sharing a common bus, are they connecting through a switch, are they connected through internet. So, it all depends on how they are interconnected. And, uh, so, uh, that communication costs are to be taken into consideration. Consequently, shared memory architectures are popular way to exploit thread level parallelism. These shared memory architectures are known as uniform memory access. So, uh, in shared memory architectures you will see uh, uh, you have a common memory which is being shared by all the processors uh, may be through a bus, uh, usually it is through a bus and uh, are popular way to exploit thread level parallelism. That means, this thread level parallelism can be more meaningfully uh, utilized in a situation where communication overhead is small and that happens in a uh, uniform memory access processor systems in UMA systems. On the other hand, uh, uh, you can consider processes as coerced grand. Coerced grand means communication to computation requirement is, I mean, uh, whenever uh, you can you can use this whenever uh, the com communication to computation requirement is lower, uh, and you can go for uh, distributed shared memory, uh, DSM in clusters, grids, etc., are meaningful. So, uh, that means, the uh, you can use uh, I mean process level parallelism in distributed shared memory architecture. So, on the other hand in UMA uh, thread level parallelism is more meaningful, on the other hand uh, this coerced grand uh, uh, parallelism I mean you can go for coerced grand uh, parallelism in distributed shared memory architecture. Uh, Now, we shall focus on uh, different types of parallel architectures that is available. Uh, this can be considered as taxonomy of parallel architectures. So, back in 1966, Flynn outlined four classes of organization of high performance computer based on instruction and data streams. So, uh, in a uh, in a uh, processing you will find that instruction is stream and data streams are there and uh, the, uh, and uh, how the instruction stream and data streams are, are flowing based on that uh, the classic classification has been done into four types these are known as S one is first one is known as sisd single instruction single data second one is uh, simd single instruction multiple data third one is MISD multiple instruction single data. So, that means, and fourth one is MIMD multiple instruction multiple data. So, you have got four type four classifications of computers uh, which was proposed uh, by Flynn back in 1966 and that, uh, even today uh, that is being used for classifying computers. So, I shall briefly discuss about uh, these four types of classifications starting with SISD, MIMD. Uh, <coughs> First, let us consider 
uh, SISD. You will require you will require control unit CU, you will require processing unit PU, you will require memory unit. These are the three hardware resources you require in your computation, Comp uh, control unit, processing unit and uh, memory unit. Normally, this control unit and processing unit, uh, you know that together is available uh, in the form of a uh, CPU, central processing unit. Now, in case of SISD, single instruction, single data, single instruction, single data, you have a uh, single instruction that is coming home, uh, coming from the control unit to the processor. That means, a single instruction is provided to the processing unit. So, you have got a single instruction stream and then also you have got a single data stream that is between the processing unit and uh, memory unit. So, here you have got instruction st st stream and here you have got data stream. So, this is typically is SISD uh, architecture where uh, you have got a single stream of instructions flowing you from the control unit to the processing unit and a uh, single stream of data uh, flowing between uh, processing unit and uh, memory unit. Then coming to the uh, coming to the uh, SIMD. single instruction and multiple data. So, here you have got the control unit. So, control unit is providing a single instruction and you have got multiple processing unit. So, you have got processing unit 1, processing unit 2, maybe processing unit n and there is a separate data stream, multiple data stream between memory unit, memory unit, memory unit 1, memory unit 2, memory unit n. So, this is your here what is happening this is not a here as you can see the memory is not shared. So, you can say this is distributed memory So, this type of thing uh, processing you do in, ca in case of your array processing and vector processing. So, this is the second type of classification single instruction and multiple data. Then coming to the uh, third type of classification that is your MIMD, I mean uh, uh, SIMD, SISD, then uh, you have got the, uh, the MIMD. In MIMD you have got uh, control unit, multiple control unit. and multiple control unit is connected to multiple processing unit and each of them is connected to separate uh, memory unit. So, uh, this is where you do with uh, uh, in this case, in this case we can say that this is uh, so okay, they can be connected through a interconnection network.
So, through the interconnection network are connected, then you have got uh, then uh, you can uh, these are uh, each of the processors are, have ma are having their local memory, this is your local memory is connected to the uh, to the processors uh, <coughs> and, and they are connected through the interconnection network. So, this is a kind of uh, uh, this is a kind of MIMD architecture connected through uh, interconnection network. You can have MIMD with shared memory as well. So, MIMD with shared memory. is also possible, where you can have multiple uh, control unit, control unit 1, control unit 2, control unit n, these are connected to multiple processing unit. processing unit 2, processing unit n and these are these are connected to a shared memory. So, uh, this is how the MIMD shared memory is occurring and uh, so, I have already discussed about these things. Uh, first one is that uh, this is the typical uniprocessor systems SISD, then you have got uh, SIMD classic form of array processors and vector processors, then and this is your MIMD, uh, MISD where multiple instruction and uh, single data is being processed. So, this one as you can see here, uh, you have got uh, different instructions coming from different processors and sim single data is being processed and, uh, and then as it happens in a systolic array and results are generated by multiple uh, uh, execution units. So, this is the typical uh, MISD architecture and finally, uh, of course, uh, this one was proposed systolic architecture was proposed in 70s, but it was, there was no commercial implementation of it. And finally, the MIMD which is general purpose and commercially important. So, uh, nowadays these MIMD processors are becoming increasingly popular and widely used. So, multiple instruction multiple data processors are becoming more and more popular. So, we shall devote some time on classifications of MIMD computers. MIMD computers can have shared memory. So, the processors communicate through a shared memory and I have already discussed about this. This is your MIMD with shared memory. So, through a shared memory the communication take place and uh, typically, uh, typically can, uh, processors are connected to each other. Uh, to the shared memory through a bus. So, usually a bus is used to communicate. That means, each of the processing elements are connected to a bus and, and uh, to the bus you can say, say it will be like this, say processing element, processing element, all the processing elements will be connected to a bus and to that bus there will be a shared memory. So, this is the typical situation of shared memory. On the other hand in distributed memory processors do not share any physical memory. So, uh, they do not share any physical memory only local memory is being shared as I have already uh, shown here. This is the distributed memory here uh, they have some local memory, uh, but they do not share any uh, physical memory processors are connected uh, to each other through a network. So, it can be a, it is usually an interconnection network through which uh, each of the processors are connected. Um, uh, they are having their local memory units and they, they do the processing using their local memory units and through the interconnection network they exchange information, they communicate with each other. So, this is again uh, some classification based on 
classifications of MIMD and actually there are two terms which are used in this context. One is known as uh, loosely coupled, loose coupling, another is known as tight coupling. loose coupling and tight coupling in the context of MIMD. So, physically uh, in case of loose, loose coupling uh, here I O level communication is done so, communication is done through I O and here it is uh, we have seen it is shared memory. So, it will be memory level communication. memory access level of communication. And in loosely coupled systems, there is no shared memory. No shared primary memory. So, primary memory uh, uh, let me uh, remind you what do we mean by primary memory. So, in a computer system you have different types of memory, primary memory, secondary memory, secondary memory is a disk storage, primary memory is from where instructions are fetched and executed. So, uh, when the processors are executing a program the instructions are fetched from the primary memory that is why uh, a special designation primary memory is given. And in case of tightly coupled system, it has got shared primary memory and no shared access space. Overlapping of access space. What do we really mean by that? This. So, no shared access space and overlapping of access space. We have seen that whenever we discussed about virtual memory, there we have seen we can, we can, we can have pages and each of the pages can be made, uh, I mean there is some flag bits which can be said and which can allow uh, uh, sharing of a page by other users or a particular page may not be allowed by shared by other users. So, whenever a page is allowed to be shared by other users that is the essentially leads to overlapping of access space. That means, the same page can be accessed by uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, programs or multiple processors, but here, uh, the, but in this case there is no uh, shared access space. So, uh, uh, in that case the memory pages are only uh, I mean it cannot be accessed by other users. So, the, there is no shared access space here overlapping of access space. And this is uh, from the viewpoint of physical interconnection then logically uh, in case of loosely coupled system there is autonomy of processes. And uh, here, uh, uh, some kind of master share, master slave effects between processes. So, uh, this is dif uh, dis di distinction in terms of uh, logical access, and here you can say whenever it is loosely coupled, you can say it is a kind of cooperative effort. And in this particular case, it is possible to have word by word interaction. So, uh, uh, the distinction between loosely coupled systems and tightly coupled systems in the context of MIMD has been discussed in detail. 
and uh, uh, very briefly I shall talk about the shared memory and distributed memory. Shared memory located at centralized location may consist of several interlib modules. Uh, interlib modules then the that means the same distance from any processors and that is the reason why it is called uniform memory access model, UMA model. That means each processor will take same time to access it. So, in case of UMA say you have got multiple processors. So, since they are sharing through a bus kind of thing, each of them will take the same amount of time and that is that that is why the term uniform memory access model and this is very popular. On the other hand, whenever memory is distributed to each processor, uh, although it improves scalability, it has got lower less latency uh, to access local memory. On the other hand, it has got higher latency for access of uh, local memory. So, that means, uh, whenever we discussed this local this particular uh, situation, whenever this processor is accessing this memory, the latency is very small. On the other hand, if this processor is allowed to access this memory, obviously, the access time will be longer. So, uh, you can see the access time is uh, not uniform uh, in such a situation, whenever the connection is through an interconnection network and that has led to the model known as non-uniform memory access. So, whenever it is non-uniform memory access, uh, the uh, we use message passing architecture, no processor can directly access other processors memory. So, uh, the communication is done by using message passing or distributed shared memory, memory is distributed, but the address space is shared as I have already mentioned, how it can be done uh, with the help of uh, that virtual memory concept. And this is the uh, typical diagram uh, uh, of a of the two different models this is the uniform memory access model. So, here there is a bus and this is the main memory or prime memory through which sharing is occurring. Although each of the processor is having their own cache memory, uh, but the memory that is being shared is the main memory or the, this is the prime memory. So, all are connected through a bus and as a consequence the access time is uniform for each of the processors. On the other hand, whenever you have got uh, this non-uniform memory access model. Each processor uh, with their built-in cache is connected to a main, main memory and that, that is being uh, connected to the network or in, uh, maybe interconnection network. And uh, whenever sharing is done, this process will take much less time to access this memory compared to this processor trying to access through the network to this memory. And not only I mean in this case the, the, uh, the time uh, and I mean access time will be different for uh, different processor for accessing different me memory devices. <coughs> so, uh, with this uh, we have come to, come to the end of today's lectures, we have uh, discussed uh, details of uh, uh, I mean differences between process what is process, what is thread and uh, the relationship between process and thread and also you have discussed about the different uh, processor models like SISD, SIMD and MIMD. Uh, with this we, uh, we conclude today's lecture. Thank you.